Hello everyone, thanks for coming to the OFA meeting today and for attending my presentation. Let me apologize right away for not being able to be here in person with everyone today. Believe me, I would have liked to. It would have been a lot less work for me on the production end of things. Um, for those of you who don't know me, let me introduce myself. My name is Jason Jolly. I teach Spanish here at Missouri State. I'm also the Region 7 representative for the Foreign Language Association of Missouri, FLAM. Um, my teaching and research interests include Spanish-American literature, Brazilian Portuguese, translation, proficiency and assessment, computer-mediated language uh, learning, motivation, and self-directed learning. Right? Um, my presentation today is going to focus mostly or touch mostly on the last three of those interests that I just mentioned. Proficiency and assessment, computer-mediated language learning, and motivation and self-directed learning. Uh, in particular, I want to talk about how these areas can be brought together in the context of a number of challenges and changes that are affecting or may soon affect our profession. You may have noticed that I changed the name of my presentation to coincide more closely with the remarks I prepared. The new title is Self-Directed Learning for Tech-Savvy Students Using Technology to Stay Relevant and Increase Learner Autonomy and Proficiency. Now, before launching into my remarks, I'd like to thank my colleague, Dr. Tanya Tinsley, for agreeing to help moderate my presentation in my absence. She'll be stopping the presentation from time to time and can take any comments or questions. There also might be a few minutes at the end of the presentation for a group discussion, hopefully. If you have any comments or questions for me, please feel free to contact me. My email is jasonjolly at missourystate.edu. And a lot of this information is also available on my faculty website. Now, I plan to use these five interrelated themes to sequence my presentation. First, technology is a game changer. We need to decide whether it is a threat, an opportunity, or both, and how to respond to it. Secondly, students we have, I think, in our classes interact differently with technology than previous generations of students we might have seen. Thirdly, education and teaching are facing significant external scrutiny and pressures. Fourth, as instructors, we can only stay relevant and employed if we adapt by conceptualizing or reconceptualizing, I should say, our roles. I guess there's actually six themes. Fifth, thanks to the internet and mobile devices, content's available everywhere, 24-7, much of it's free and a very good quality. And finally, there's some really good reasons to encourage or for us to encourage our students to take advantage of online content. So let's begin by talking about technology being a game changer. What do I mean by this? Well, technology has changed how people access information, as we all know. The internet in particular has upended entire industries. There's lots of this in the news all the time. And so the question is, could education be next? Let's look at some examples of how technology has recently affected certain companies and sectors of the economy. We can point to, for example, music stores. Here's an item about Tower Records declaring bankruptcy back in 2006. We know this is because of online music services like at the time Napster. Now we have iTunes and the iPod player and things like that. Music is just much more easy to, to download and to pay for. Uh, likewise, a lot of video stores, including our local Hollywood videos, have gone out of business. I like the little sign taped to the glass here, closed forever. Now obviously, Netflix has bitten into a lot of market share and only certain video stores have been able to adapt quickly enough to survive. So video stores, rest in peace. Um, thirdly, Bookstores, you might have just heard in the news a few weeks back that Borders has filed for bankruptcy protection and will close its Springfield store. Okay? Okay. Clearly also this is due to technology biting into its market share. We have the Kindle, we have iBooks and things like that, or the, uh, the application, the reader application on the iPhone and the iPad. Right? Makes it much easier for people to download and pay for books. Uh, another sector uh, that's been struggling a lot related in terms of the publishing industry are newspapers. There's actually a website called newspaperdeathwatch.org because so many print versions of newspapers are folding as people turn to blogging and online versions of newspapers, those that survive, to get their news. Now, technology and advances in communication have also led to a big boom in outsourcing which has affected lots of industries and, as we know, has cost a lot of Americans their jobs. So, what are some of these 
sectors, right? Well, we know that there's a lot of outsourcing and customer service. If you've, if you've made a customer service call lately, you'll know that. Uh, information technology is another area. Financial services are outsourced. Industry, obviously, manufacturing, outsourced to markets where they have cheaper labor. Question is, could education, teaching, be next? So, how did we get to this point? Well, it's actually too late for us to be asking that question. It's not really relevant. Maybe it is, but it's too late anyway. According to Jeff Jarvis, a better question to ask is, what would Google do? Right? He writes, quote, When faced with any challenge today, it makes sense to ask, what would Google do? In management, commerce, news, media, marketing, service industries, investing, politics, government, and even education and religion, answering that question is a key to navigating a world that has radically changed forever. So his basic thesis is that Google's been able to do lots of things well. So in this new post-Google or Google age, we need to answer the question, what would Google do? All right, more on that later. Oh, and by the way, Jarvis dedicates an entire chapter to the future of education in the post-Google universe. He begins it by observing that, quote, just as every institution explained in this book is facing fundamental change to its essence, changes to its essence and existence in the Google age, so is education. Indeed, education is one of the institutions most deserving of disruption and with the greatest opportunities to come of it." Close quote. All right, now let's take a moment, we'll have Tanya pause the video here, to consider a few questions. Now, let's move on and talk briefly about how our students are using technology these days. Our students experience technology differently than previous generations of young people, it seems to me. And to understand how they learn and to help them learn, we need to appreciate how they're using technology, how it is that they view technology. Now, I've read quite a bit about the so-called millennial generation and the post-millennials, right? I also have two teenagers that have cell phone plans with unlimited texting, right? My daughter sends more than 2,000 texts per month. And also, they're both addicted to Facebook, as am I, right? But the following set of observations simply reflect what I've noticed in recent years. Not necessarily a scientific study, or I'm not quoting anyone. It's just what I've been able to observe talking to my students, talking to my teenage uh, son and daughter. So it seems to me that these post-millennials, these students that you might have in your high school classes or the younger students we might have in our university classes, they seem to have very short attention spans. Have you noticed? You look out and you see sort of the blank stares. Their hands just want to go for those cell phones. They're bored many times. Um, and it's not necessarily our fault. It's because they've become accustomed to things happening so quickly. They say they're multitaskers, that they can do things, uh, multiple things at a time, right? Like check their email on their cell phone, while they're studying for a test, whatever. Um, another thing my students have told me is that they don't email and that they haven't emailed anyone for years except for teachers who ask them to email. So that's just sort of an interesting fact. Um, they prefer to text rather than talk on the phone, for example. Um, so they'll send those thousands of texts per month. Um, obviously, they're very plugged into social networking sites, Facebook, but also Twitter, many of them. Um, they use PCs and laptops, but more and more, their smartphones are becoming their computers. And this isn't limited just to teens, right? We, we are following these same trends. One thing I've noticed with my students is that they rely heavily on the internet to get answers to their questions and for their own learning, which is very relevant to my presentation today. Jeff Jarvis, the person I just mentioned who wrote the book, What Would Google Do? thinks that this is a good thing, right? Um, also, students today, it seems, they assume that everything should be able to be done online, and they get frustrated when they can't do something online, when something's not available online. Okay? Why can't I do this online, they often ask. And so, bottom line is, students expect to experience life through some type of an interface, right? Face-to-face -face is still out there, but interface is more and more important. Our students experience life through various types of interfaces, and they're perfectly comfortable with that. So, let's take a look at a few more questions if we have time. I'll leave that up to Tanya's discretion. 
All right, now let's turn our discussion to some of the new pressures and threats, or recent pressures and threats, our profession is facing. I believe that these factors must play, have to play, into how we decide to deploy technology in our teaching. In the midst of the economic crisis, education and the teaching profession have come under intense public scrutiny. Teachers are facing blame and new pressures from a variety of sources. I probably don't have to tell you this. Significant changes to the traditional educational paradigm are coming, and they will involve technology. So, the next slide has just a sort of summary of some of these uh, pressures that I've noticed just recently. Um, first, public employees, in particular teachers, have taken a lot of blame for state's budgetary problems. We see this with the Wisconsin case in which teachers have been scapegoated and lost their collective bargaining rights. Right? all under the pretext of the state's budgetary problems. Also, taxpayers and legislators are demanding increased accountability from educators. We're being asked to prove that our students are learning, to show the proof, right? implement assessment. Uh, we have things like No Child Left Behind with all its standardized tests and things like that. Um, not that all of these things are bad. right? Now, recently, ha uh, Missouri House Bill 628 has made some news. As most of you probably know, this bill would propose uh, proposes an end to the tenure system in public schools and has um, mechanisms that would tie pay to regular performance reviews. And part of that pay um, or pay for performance evaluation would be tied to students' scores on tests and things like that. Okay. Also, we have this theme of access, right? The mandate to serve more students or to do more with less. That's another pressure that I think educators are feeling. Um, and there's also even been talk of outsourcing uh, teaching in some states. For example, in the state of Idaho, their commissioner of education recently looked seriously into um, outsourcing teaching in that state, including the teaching of languages. And as you may know, there are several companies now around the United States and in other countries that would be happy to step into your classrooms virtually. All right, now let me just say that I don't believe that all these changes or pressures are necessarily bad things, but they are major changes to the traditional paradigm and many imply a smaller, leaner workforce in which greater reliance on technology is going to be a given. So a person who provides great perspective and vision regarding these changes is George Mahaffey, Vice President for Academic uh, Leadership and Change at the American Association of States and State Colleges and Universities. Forgive me for reading so much, but I'm reading from the screen here. No, not, not super professional. He published a paper titled Medieval Models, Agrarian Calendars, and 21st Century Imperatives in the fall 2010 uh, volume of Teacher Scholar. The article is available online. Just Google it, right? Uh, Medieval Models, Agrarian Calendars, and 21st Century Imperatives. I highly recommend that you read it in its entirety, but I am going to quote pretty extensively from it in this presentation. Mahaffey's remarks primarily concern higher education at public universities, but I would argue that many of them apply to public K through school, uh, K through 12 schools as well, and might even be easier to implement more quickly in the um, middle or secondary setting. Um, Mahaffey writes that, quote, those of us in public education are approaching our own crisis of imagination and adaptation. We confront rapid changes in the circumstances and context in which public higher education operates, again, think K-12 through also, and yet we seem unable to respond with the creative and innovative solutions that will ensure our success. Again, that's a quote from that article by uh, George Mahaffey. A few more things from that article. He says, quote, someone recently said that the core problem is that higher education was designed in the 11th century and operates on a 19th century agrarian calendar while trying to prepare students for life and work in the 21st century. Continuing with another quotation, in this new century, three forces, declining funding, rising expectations, and rapidly developing technology will profoundly challenge public higher education. And again, I would add K through 12 education as well. Continuing with the quotation, my core thesis is simple. Resources for public universities are either declining or at least stable, with little realistic hope for recovery to previously experienced levels. Yet, we are being asked to serve more students and serve them better." Close quote. So that's that idea of doing 
more with less. All right, Mihaffey goes on to say that, quote, today's challenge for public higher education, reduced to its core elements, is simply this. How do we educate more students to higher levels of learning outcomes with less money? Uh, he also says, quote, I would argue that technology, the internet, search capacities like Google, and our ability to find, aggregate, and use information in new, networked, more powerful ways represents a profound challenge to the university, also K-12 system, as we know it. We're now moving towards an age where information is created, aggregated, and disseminated in powerfully different ways." Close quote. So those are some key ideas from George Mahaffey about sort of the changing nature of the profession and some of the uh, pressures that are beginning to face us as educators. All right, one more slide from Mahaffey. He says, quote, the model of the university is a collection of experts, the model of teaching that requires expert knowledge, the model of an institution that requires the physical presence of human beings. All of these are being called into question in the information age. Let's take a look at a couple questions. So just what do I mean when I say that we need to think about reconceptualizing our roles as professors and teachers? Let's take a closer look. I'd say that to remain relevant in a time when expertly designed and delivered content is available for free 24-7, instructors need to reconceptualize their roles. We need to shift our emphasis from content delivery, covering the material, to doing other things that will improve learning outcomes for our students. Now Mihaffey talks a lot about the what he calls the explosion in content, all this content that's readily available online, for example and how this is going to end up redefining what instructors do. Again, he's talking about university professors primarily, but there's no reason not to apply this to the K-12 environment. He writes, quote, For many years, the typical model in universities was not only a focus on teaching, not learning, but teaching in a special frame of reference. Far too often, teaching was largely about content and delivering content from one person, the expert, to someone else who was not the expert, the student. Today, of course, content's everywhere, available instantaneously and doubling every 18 months. The amount of information is doubling every 18 months. Back to the quotation. Millions of video clips on the internet, dominated by YouTube, but also other sources like the fascinating TED lecture series, where at the click of a mouse, you can watch world leaders, scientists, activists, Nobel Prize winners, and other extraordinary human beings describe their research, their ideas, and their dreams. TED, of course, is only one tiny fraction of the material from one source. There's also coursework from MIT and millions and millions of other sources of content, including Missouri State Free Cloak. Okay, close quote. Um, Mahaffey believes that teachers need to re-envision or reconceptualize what they do to basically rewrite our job descriptions. He writes, quote, one way to begin thinking about change is to consider faculty work. Faculty have traditionally had four primary roles with, with, with respect to teaching and learning. They select the content that's most critical, design the educational experiences that will optimize learning, deliver instruction, and assess learning outcomes and assign grades. It seems to me, he writes, that faculty have spent more time on the delivery of content than on the design of effective educational experiences. I think that far too often, the dominant focus is on content, on, quote, getting through the material, close quote. Given the challenges facing education, Mihaffey suggests that instructors place less emphasis on playing the expert, dishing out content, and focus more on other important aspects of their jobs. He writes, quote, in a content-rich environment with unlimited access to information, the role of the faculty member should be profoundly different. Faculty, teachers, should focus most of their efforts on creating learning environments, interactive places where students can learn. This doesn't necessarily mean classrooms. Indeed, to create higher quality learning for more students, uh, let's see, to create higher quality learning for more students, faculty may have to spend the majority of their teaching work outside of the classrooms. Let me just repeat that part. To create higher quality learning for more students, faculty may have to spend the majority of their teaching work outside of the classrooms, designing activities for students outside of class. 
I emphasize that because that's what my presentation is going moving toward. Back to the quotation. Increasingly, faculty may have to be the designers of student work that's done independent of faculty. Faculty in that kind of circumstance would also play a supportive problem-solving role as well as a certifier of learning outcomes. The conception of the course and how it's delivered and the role of the faculty member in the course would shift radically. Let's take a few more questions if we have time. Okay, Tanya. All right, now I'd like to shift gears just a little bit and talk more about this explosion of content that Mihafi was referring to. Thanks to the internet and especially mobile devices now, content's available anywhere and any place, any time. We can take it with us, access it anytime. Also, much of this content is free and of very good quality. Some of these resources have the potential to greatly enhance our students' language proficiency. When it comes to language teaching and learning, I think it can be useful to think of all of this online content, these online resources, as falling into two broad categories. First, we have resources that are designed specifically for the purpose of language learning. Examples of these kinds of language learning resources include uh, complete standalone online language courses like the BBC website offers for free, language tutorial websites, right, that may have quiz and exercise banks like, um, what's, what, what's an example of that? Um, StudySpanish.com would be an example of this category for me. Also, you have databases or collections of games and activities. Kia.com comes to mind. There are also online video tutorials that target language. Um, there are language exchange websites where speakers of one language seek out partners who speak the other language, and the idea is for them to teach each other the language and the culture. A great example of this is LiveMocha.com. And of course, your students already know this, there are iPhone apps and Android apps and things like that that target language learning that people can take with them, and many others. Now, I'd just quickly like to share one concrete example of a language learning resource. Right? One that I really like and often recommend to my own students is the website LiveMocha.com. And here's why I like it. LiveMocha has courses in more than 20 languages and adding new ones all the time. These courses are media rich, right? They have images, sound, video. Uh, they're interactive. Users, as you're going through the course, you're going to find tips on pronunciation, grammar, vocabulary that other users have left. And also, when you submit an exercise, you get feedback either um, orally or typed from other users, written from other users uh, on those activities that you submit, right? Another plus is that much, not all, but much of the content is free. The use of the introductory courses are free. Also, LiveMocha.com is a language exchange website, but it also has built-in social networking. You can add friends, and also you can instant message with those friends using text or video conferencing capabilities right within the site. Another plus is that anything you do on LiveMocha can be shared on your Facebook profile. So other people can see when you've completed a course, when you've submitted an activity. Of course, this is a great idea because it helps the website LiveMocha grow. Now, a second broad category of online resources are those that are not necessarily de designed with language learners in mind, but which contain authentic content that instructors and learners can view, listen to, interact with. We might call these language exposure resources as opposed to language learning resources. Um, examples of these would be um, just about any website written in the target language, right, because it's going to provide those authentic texts. A good place to go are the web portals, like, for example, Windows Live in Spanish or the French version of a um, television station, right, because typically these web portals have lots of um, media-rich content. They'll have um, songs you can listen to videos you can view. They'll have forums in which you can interact with native speakers. Um, also, there is video content produced by target language speakers, not necessarily for the purpose of teaching the language, but just people speaking their mind, right? Like the vlogs on YouTube. I have a great list of Spanish vlogs from many different countries if anyone's interested. Um, social networking tools can also be a good thing for learners and teachers to use to teach the language. And there are some language-specific 
um, social networking sites like Duente.com, which is a Spanish version of Facebook, pretty much. There's a site called Orkut, which is very popular with um, Brazilian speakers and uh, Portuguese speakers in Brazil. Um, and many people use Twitter. It's so easy to add some um, some users on Twitter that speak Spanish, French, German, whatever, and just follow those tweets. Every day you're getting some exposure to the language. Um, also, you, learners can use instant messaging tools, chat sites, video conferencing communities. Um, basically, anything you can do online in your native language, you can do online in the target language and derive some benefit from that. So if we have time, let's discuss a few more questions. Over the past few years, um, I've been implementing something in my classes to encourage my students to make the best of resources available outside of the classroom, both on and offline, and to work independently. I call these autonomous language learning activities. Now, autonomous language learning activities are activities that the learner chooses. I do not give my students any real requirements, although I do model and recommend certain types of activities, but ultimately the learner chooses which activities to do. I don't even necessarily put restrictions on if they can do just one translation or just one listening comprehension or just one. I let them decide. Uh, these are activities that are done outside of class on the learner's own time. These are activities that require exposure or interaction with some kind of authentic uh, target, uh, target language, linguistic, or cultural input, right? These can be done online or not. It might involve just a print version of a magazine um, or a recipe or a menu that a, that a student finds at a Spanish restaurant or a French restaurant. So online, there's a gazillion resources, but there are lots of resources that are not online, and those are fine, too. Um, these uh, activities require learners to use a log to document and reflect on their learning, which I think is important. And uh, what I do is um, I have them put, you know, a certain number, maybe 15 activities over the course of a semester and check these portfolios, evaluate them, give them feedback at two or three different points, portfolio checkpoints, uh, during the semester. Right now, this slide here, the next slide is going to give you a very quick idea of the diversity of activities that students choose to do on their own outside of class. I could cite dozens, if not hundreds, of other types of activities that students have done. So, for example, uh, students sometimes will transcribe song lyrics. I've had students write poetry, write short narratives, write longer film reviews. I've had students prepare a dish from a recipe and bring me part of it. Um, students typically email or instant message native speakers. They might print out those chat transcripts. Um, a popular activity is to watch foreign films and then to sort of make a topical vocabulary list as they, as they go. Um, I have students write and uh, perform original dialogues. Um, they've recorded video blogs and posted them on YouTube um, of their own initiative. And often students will, if they are Hispanic, for example, um, talk about um, or document a conversation that they might have had with their mother who lives in Mexico or an aunt or a grandfather or something like that. Um, one of the best reasons for having or for giving students greater autonomy, right, independence, to engage in self-directed learning activities is that these kinds of activities, as well as the control or independence given to the learners, is very compatible with types of motivation that lead to increased language proficiency. So, in particular, they're compatible with Gardner's notion of integrated motivation and Desi and Ryan, these are two researchers from Rochester University, their model called self-determination theory, in which autonomy is seen as crucial to what they call intrinsic motivation. Okay? So here's a slide detailing that. In Gardner's model, instrumental, he talks about instrumental and integrative motivation. Instrumental motivation is sort of that utilitarian, learning the second language for pragmatic reasons only, while integrative motivation involves, quote, a genuine interest in learning the second language in order to come psychologically close to the other language community. It, quote, reflects the various attributes that can be linked to the cultural context of the language, close quote. Now, Desi and Ryan have demonstrated that, quote, in their words, conditions supporting the individual's experience of autonomy are argued to foster the most volitional and high-quality forms of motivation and engagement for activities. 
including enhanced performance, persistence, and creativity. Don't we want that from our students? Enhanced performance, persistence, and creativity. They're basically saying if that's what we want, we have to give them some control and some responsibility. All right. In addition to the benefits of increased motivation, especially good kinds of motivation, autonomous language learning activities are conducive to other important pedagogical approaches. For example, uh, they work well in the context of proficiency or standards-based instructions, okay, as long as we explain the expected outcomes and the assessment modes. Um, they complement student-centered learning models, which are very popular these days, active learning, experiential learning, free choice learning most, most closely, I think, and student-directed learning. These are all different modalities that have been in vogue um, that are interesting in and of themselves, but I think that this type of um, autonomous language learning activity is very supportive of, these, of all of these approaches. Um, they also promote the personalization of learning in different forms, right? They can help us differentiate the curriculum, and they can help us account for differences in learning styles, strategies, and intelligent types. My own observations and discussions with students, sort of informally, have convinced me that encouraging students to engage in self-directed learning can have a number of benefits. For example, um, autonomous lear language learning activities help learners increase their proficiency outside of class. They allow learners to connect or to associate language learning with their own interests. So for example, if I have a kid that's interested in baseball, he can study Spanish as it relates to baseball, and to him that's more motivating. Um, they have the potential to increase learner motivation. They encourage habits of lifelong learning because these are things that once the learners begin to do them, they realize, huh, I can do this during the summer. I can do this anytime. And they help to make learners more responsible for their own learning, which is something that I very much want, and I imagine you do too. Now I'd like to share just a few simple things that I've learned that have helped me to successfully integrate learner autonomy and outside of the classroom technology enhanced activities into my courses. So first, um, first thing that I think is important is to educate students regarding proficiency standards and expected learning and performance outcomes. Our students need to know what it means to be novice high, intermediate low, intermediate mid. They need to know what that means in terms of their speaking, their listening comprehension, their writing. We need to explain that to them and make clear what the different thresholds are. Um, we want to build opportunities for students to direct their own learning into the curriculum. This is what you might call structured autonomy. You want them to have choice, but within a framework, right, within your regular curriculum. Um, we also want to recommend and model in front of them, right, best practices for using not just online resources, but all different types of resources that might be available to them outside of class. We encourage our students to document and reflect on the learning activities they engage in outside of class. I see some typos on this slide, but that's okay. So that's why I use the um, Autonomous Language Learning Activities log. And Tanya's going to have some copies of that that she can distribute, or you can contact me for, for some copies, a digital copy of that. Make sure that these efforts, these things that students do outside of class, count toward the grade, because it's just human nature. <laughs> no matter how much we talk about motivation, one of the biggest motivations, an extrinsic, instrumental type of motivation that's important for students nonetheless, is their grade. Is this going to count? Right? So make it count. Um, and then finally, sort of a general concern, trust your students with control. They may only be 14, 15, or they may be 23-year-old or 43-year-old university students. But give them some control. Give them some independence and autonomy. They just may surprise you. No, I guarantee they will surprise you with what they do on their own outside of class. Okay, I really believe that these kinds of student-directed activities are a perfect fit for our tech-savvy, multitasking, short attention span students at any level. Giving students choices and helping them to make good use of their autonomy is a strategy consistent with what Mihaffey says about the need to reconceptualize our roles as teacher in light of the changing realities affecting our profession. Technology really is a game changer for us as teachers and for our students. And make no mistake about it, if we stand in the way of our students' use of technology for learning, rather than thoughtfully facilitate it, we will quickly be seen, first by them, but later by administrators and the public in general, as irrelevant. According to Jarvis, 
That's the reality we live in now. In What Would Google Do? He writes, quote, give, us the, give the people control and we will use it. Don't and you will lose us. That is the essential rule of the new age. Previously, the powerful companies, institutions, and governments believed that they were in control, and they were, but no more. Now the internet allows us to speak to the world, to organize ourselves, to find and to spread information, to challenge old ways, to retake control. So it's kind of a powerful quote if you think about it. Take just a second to think about how this applies to our profession, to our students, to their parents, to administrators, etc. Okay, I know you're probably tired of listening to me talk. <laughs> I'm tired of listening to me talk. In closing, I'd just like to say that I'm not suggesting that we're going to anytime soon be replaced by Google-designed robots or highly trained people Skyped in from India. I'm also not saying that I think that online materials can or should replace quality teaching and best practices led by real people in classrooms. What I am suggesting is that we need to evolve in our roles and to think creatively when it comes to designing and implementing solutions that really can balance the demand that we demonstrate our students' achievement with the reality of diminishing public funding of and tolerance for traditional approaches. I'm also suggesting that viewing technology as the enemy is counterproductive to such evolution. What I really hope to get through today, get across to you today, is that online language learning resources or language exposure resources are growing in quantity and improving rapidly in quality, and that we can better serve our students by equipping them to use these resources judiciously, on their own time, and in ways that complement our assessment goals, learning outcomes, and classroom objectives. So, rather than competing with or denigrating technology, we need to think about how to better integrate it into our teaching and assessment plans and begin to encourage our students to take more responsibility for their own learning. If we focus more on making our students aware of the proficiency goals and other learning outcomes, modeling effective uses of technology, recommending quality resources, and encouraging them to sharpen their skills outside of the classroom, we not only equip them for learning and working in a 21st century environment, we become more relevant to all kinds of constituencies, and we stand a better chance of surviving the changes confronting the profession.